now Jerome and Mr. Mr. Harry um, built a very nice nice bridge. Uh, I wanted to say and now to something completely different, as my uh, Monty Python would uh, put it. Um, yeah, heterogeneous networking for cooperative applications. I want to talk a little about cooperative applications, even though I think we heard uh, something in that um, with that respect already. Then um, a little outlook beyond uh, IPSC5 or 11P for ITS. What what else could there be? I mean, some people think it's just 11P, some people think it's just LTE, uh, depending on whom you talk to. And then um, heterogeneous networking. What is the problem, and why is it a problem, and can we solve it? So, starting with cooperative ap applications. So, um, cooperative applications can be a lot of things, but in, at least in our domain, it's basically systems that interact with each other in the real world, and we want them to exchange informations, uh, information. Communication allows us to exchange history, status, as we heard, intent maybe for future um, systems, <coughs> measurements, and, and all these different stuff. It allows us to align strategies, like we saw um, with crossing the intersection. Um, and also maybe resolution of conflicts. I mean, basically two cars at the same point in time would be a conflict, I, I assume. Um, common <coughs> characteristics that we see is communication is with local relevance. I think in most of the car-to-car -car cooperative um, situations at least. Um, delay requirements for the communication are often coupled with proximity, meaning that uh, the closer uh, two entities are together, um, the less time we want to wait until we get the information from one part to the other. Um, however, this also means if they move farther away, there's more room for us um, on, the, on the delay or latency point of view. And as we already heard today, awareness, whatever it is, is a very um, important concept. It can be provided either by sensors or by exchanging status information once in a while, um, often referred to as beaconing. I think this is uh, quite straightforward. So, um, I'm not sure, is anyone familiar with CAM and DAM? Because then I don't have to explain them anymore. Or the other way around, is somebody not familiar with CAM and DAM? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so basically what we see in local communication, and this is what I want to um, outline here with, with the today's system, is we broadcast information in one direction. So, um, especially what we hear, heard right now with uh, measuring just the delay for propagation, it's already difficult because we have an information flow in one direction without any kind of feedback. So it's fire and forget, more or less. Um, on the other hand, we have cloud or backend based solutions often provided by OEMs or third party providers for entertainment, traffic information and so forth, which usually is a common client or a client server architecture where you have just um, some web service that provides you with uh, roadworks uh, information or whatever you can come up with. The CITS roadmap, and I don't want to go into detail of, with all of this, we see right now we're basically I think, here with deployment, we're moving towards this, depending on which OEM you ask, but I mean... <laughs> Um, we are already in phase five. I, <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, everyone thinks that he's in, in phase five. Because, I mean, we, we are all above average drivers, I know. Um, so, but I mean, we're talking about the cooperation aspect. So, um, this is maybe the one thing that is important for me here. So, I mean, I will still get back to this just broadcasting information once in a while because it's maybe easier to grasp and there's at least some knowledge about that because the further you go to the right, the more fuzzy everything gets, basically. What could we see in the future? And I don't want to talk about platooning again, because uh, Katrin already uh, provided an insight for that, but I want to highlight one thing. Uh, when talking to other people about platooning, they kind of say, we see maybe three stages. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, for, for the whole platooning thing, we, we need a long range path to find a platoon. So I don't know, I'm, I'm starting to drive and I need to find a platoon. Then we need some kind of communication to join a platoon and then basically we need to manage the platoon once it's, uh, um, it's formed. So I even talked to people, and now we come already to the heterogeneous part, that proposed use three different technologies for, uh, for the three stages. It's a valid approach, but maybe hard to, to sell to people. I don't know. Um, what we at least see is that 10 Hz cams are not enough for platooning, I think you agree. 
Um, and uh, what we currently see in discussion is either use another channel or maybe even another technology. I mean, we talked about 63 GHz, I think, at some point. Um, some completely different aspect is the sort of distributed consensus, which maybe relates more to the intersection problem that we um, heard earlier today, um, where we basically want to find some agreement in a distributed world. So if you take away the um, central controller, this becomes a really difficult problem, especially um, if you don't tolerate misunderstandings, meaning um, you need a safe state at all uh, times, which, again, forces you to have reliable communication or a very good scheme to ensure that um, everyone's on the same page. There are some algorithmic examples here, I don't want to go too much into detail, so they have been studied in literature but not applied to B2B so far, at least not um, to the best of my knowledge. So, what other technology options are there beyond 11P? And um, I mean, um, you may, may be, at, depending on the field, a better expert than I am. So currently we see a lot of people talking about LTE D2D. What they basically mean is, um, I think, the proximity services uh, introduced with release 12. Um, this is all very nice. Uh, however, uh, first of all, there are, I think, no devices available. So it's hard to get your hands on any kind of hardware that can do LTE device to device. Um, second of all, um, people, I haven't uh, investigated this myself, that uh, as soon as you don't have any infrastructure, the setup um, and the connection device discovery is very, very slow and therefore not um, useful for, uh, let's say, safety related applications. So there's LTE V2X coming to the rescue. Um, even further down the road, um, it's supposed to be an evolu evolution of the uh, device to device uh, cycling targeted for release 14, meaning that we might see some devices maybe in 2020, 2019, I don't know. Um, we will see. I can't say much about it. I can't even say less about 5G because uh, everyone thinks 5G can solve all the problems. I don't know. I mean, they have the ambitious goal of one millisecond latency for um, V2V. I think it's only um, on the air interface, but still, uh, I don't know. However, we will see that we have different technologies, and maybe the most important part about 5G is that it's supposed to be a combination of multiple technologies and paradigms, which already, in turn, would be heterogeneous in whatever way this might be solved. Another thing I think Jerome already mentioned today, and <laughs> it's nice that you uh, brought this up, um, would be mobile edge computing, meaning, I mean, fog or cloudlets or whatever you want to call it. So um, the basic idea is that you do some uh, local processing uh, close to the edge of a mobile network where um, you can provide additional information, you can maybe even act as a virtual roadside unit. So being a roadside unit that is close to the road but uh, connected by a cellular. And uh, something that we did uh, as part of a just proof of concept is we took uh, the CAM and DAM based use cases, um, installed some kind of small distribution service um, on the mobile edge and ran the uh, standard Etsy protocols uh, basically over a, customer, uh, over a commercial LTE link in a commercial LTE like network. So with load from other users and all that. And what we can see is that even during rush hour, we can provide vehicle to vehicle latencies of 10 to 20, uh, 20 milliseconds with an off the shelf commercial um, LTE device and some more edge uh, computing. This obviously is not, I mean, you need to have more edge computing capable uh, base stations, which uh, is hard to find, I think. And you need um, additional stuff as well. But, I mean, just as a proof of concept that you can do low delay communication over other um, networks as well. And obviously, there are even um, more things. I mean, we heard about 28 gigahertz today. And there's also this um, ITS G63, or whatever you want to call it. So 63 gigahertz um, communication for um, ITS systems, which provides high bandwidth only at short range and usually only light of sight, but people think it could be used for raw sensor data, advanced platooning stuff, automated driving, so really just exchanging information bumper to bumper, so from the car in front of you. Um, and, I mean, there are a lot of other options as well you can think of, satellite, wide infrastructure, Bluetooth, 
even visible light. So there are a lot of technologies and what um, at least I kind of um, think about the current discussion is that uh, applications are very tightly linked to a specific technology, at least in our heads. Maybe not on paper and most of the standards at least are fairly open uh, towards what kind of technology to use. But um, a lot of these things are at least in, in practice linked to a specific technology. So, um, state of the art heterogeneous networking, the theory, what I already mentioned, the standard itself um, has an access layer and if you have the more detailed picture you find a lot of access technologies on the bottom, meaning um, the current ATSI ITS communications uh, architecture on paper is very um, heterogeneous, or at least it allows to be very heterogeneous. So it's technology agnostic, it, um, as I said. It also provides some networking layer um, functionality, geo-networking, which is basically position-based addressing and routing. Um, with embedded security, we have um, IPv6 kind of support um, and um, some other things. So uh, what is maybe uh, important is that it is um, supported by the car to car communication for, uh, consortium, meaning that the OEMs like it. There are other approaches as well. Um, but uh, I think this would uh, be take too much of our time. So how does this heterogeneous thing look in practice today? I need to talk to car manufacturers and look at different projects um, that, that at least supposedly dealt with heterogeneous networking. You see that they use multiple technologies, but they assign basically one application or at least one subservice of, of the application statically to one technology. Meaning that um, you know what you do because, I mean, they develop or it's developed uh, to fit the technology they know. Uh, if you have something that is supported by both kinds of networks, it's usually some kind of infrastructure to vehicle broadcast dissemination stuff um, with the idea that you use uh, individual links to, a broad to send something from the cellular network to an 11P equipped vehicle and then you do a broadcast. So this is basically a hack around the uh, missing availability of EMVMS and other um, broadcast systems in a cellular network. So this is what you currently see in, um, in, in projects that uh, are on, at least are, are done by that by, um, today. So um, if you want to do V2V with that, or basically cooperative local applications, then you have to have go the way to the cloud and then back to the vehicle, and you typically see latencies over one second. So Real time, uh, it's, it's still real time if you define the time limit high enough, but, well. So now I learned uh, during our lunch break <laughs> that I chose a very bad example. Um, I still try to stick with it, even though um, there might be a better one. So, um, like I said, statically uh, assigned technologies. So what I would propose is uh, use the available technologies in an ad adaptive way, meaning that you don't assign uh, something beforehand. Um, here we have, uh, as an example, the intersection collision warning, which basically uh, is based, or it, it's, yeah, it's based on exchange of cam messages um, of the vehicle, so that you can detect on ongoing or oncoming cross traffic. So now we assume, and we assume, I know that in reality this doesn't hold true, uh, that we cannot communicate around the corner, at least not early enough to provide some kind of warning. So further assume it's the middle of the night. Nobody's around, so there's nobody else who could help you to relay, relay any kind of message, even with multi-hop communication, and basically all the networks are empty. So why not use, for example, cellular links that are already available in the, in the vehicle? I mean, the cellular networks should be uh, fairly available um, in terms of channel resources as well, because it's the middle of the night, um, so why not? But, I mean, I'm, I'm, I still, I heard this quote, and I'm not sure where, who or uh, made it in the first place, CAM is spam. Um, this is from either a network operator or, I mean, from, from cellular guys at least, <laughs> saying that you, you don't put CAMs on a cellular network. And I mean, in terms of scalability, they are totally right. However, um, there might be occasions, or at least with a lower frequency, where it would make sense to um, do this over a different technology. So. Um, at least in theory, adaptive technology selection uh, should be a good thing because we can use whatever is available in an efficient way. So, what do we have here? Yeah. Um, 
Since I'm a network guy, uh, our network layer guy, I say this obviously is a network layer problem. I mean, usually you do this on the network layer and not let the applications fiddle with all this uh, different technologies and abstractions and so forth. So um, here we have a more complex picture with roadside units connected by wired infrastructure. We have some kind of uh, cellular network and we have um, ad hoc communication. So a possible path for a packet assuming now multi-hop communication, for example, for a dam or something, forwarding to a relevance area could either take this way, it could go through the vehicles, it could go through the back end, depending on um, a lot of factors. Well, if you look into the literature, then you find uh, very quickly the so-called network selection problem, which is um, widely investigated in a lot of areas usually following this always best connected um, idea. Uh, for example, if you want to stream a video and you have Wi-Fi and cellular in your device, you want to switch to the network that provides you the best service, which um, is obvi obviously a straightforward thing. But for cooperative applications, this is not so easy because basically we, we talk about interaction, so there's no specific client-server thing where I request a service and then I can measure the performance of the service. Because, I mean, as we already um, heard, in the um, worst case, we're talking into one direction. So we never get any feedback and it's hard to um, estimate um, any kind of quality parameters. Um, awareness um, just requires basically the best information or the, yeah, the best information quality, whatever that means for the specific application, and on time. So um, we could maybe talk about always best informed, at least for a couple of these applications of coin some other phrase. Uh, I just wanted to say that it's not the same. And um, what we really need to do is basically when sending messages, at least in the first step, find the best outgoing interface or interfaces to send the message to. Under the assumption that everyone can listen to all available channels or avail all available channels simultaneously. Which does not mean that everyone has to have all the technologies. But then, obviously, you have to take this into account when you're selecting an outgoing interface, that you have something that the other one is listening to. But at least, um, from a car perspective, for example, uh, it's not like, um, I would say, a power problem, for example, to uh, listen on all the devices at the same time. So it's not like with a cellular phone where you can gain a lot of uh, long sleeping cycles, um, for example, and where it makes sense to disengage um, Wi-Fi if you don't use it. So, um, this year is, I think, uh, from a paper a couple of years ago, um, the network selection problem already in the vehicular context. So this is quite straightforward what you usually do. You define some criteria, and then you try to measure them, then you weigh the different criteria, and in the end you have some ranking sort of approach that kind of um, gives you, as an output, use this interface. This is very nice. However, if you try to apply this uh, to the problem I mentioned, um, things become difficult because we have very different technologies with very different characteristics and it is not so easy to kind of put them into one context and saying, okay, now we have them comparable. I mean, in, in traditional um, systems you might measure something like uh, the quality of service that you get, but like I said, this is not possible in our system. So, um, most probably we have to rely on heuristics to uh, beforehand, um, let's say, estimate uh, the uh, probability of success in a certain area. Then, maybe the main problem is uh, getting the values. I mean, like I said, we decide as a, as a sender and the receiver basically can determine whether it, I was successful or not. So, um, either we have some kind of closed loop and we get some feedback once in a while whether our selection was good or not, or um, this is basically just guessing, at least without uh, additional information exchange. Um, Another thing is, at least in a distributed system, that um, instead of measuring one link to an access network, where you get a lot of traffic over this one link, um, you, measure, you basically have to measure to each peer, because, I mean, the conditions to each peer might be different. I mean, one is around the corner, so you can hardly reach it via one wireless technology, the other one is right next to you. So you cannot just say, okay, we, we all put this in one uh, big bin and say, okay, 11P doesn't work right now, but it's rather like 11P doesn't work for car A, but it might work for car B. But this um, leads to the problem that we have very few measurement samples uh, for each um, destination. 
So, um, in fact, we need to intelligently group uh, these vehicles again to at least derive some kind of uh, metric. Furthermore, context information that we have from, um, let's say, previous experience or whatever can be um, very useful. Um, for the weighing and the ranking, I think um, there are different approaches. You can do it with expert knowledge, you can use statistical approaches. Even machine learning is, I think, a very promising field, especially if you have so many questions. And I, unfortunately, I only have the questions. I would like to provide you some answers, but this is what we are hopefully uh, achieving in the second half of the t project. Still, at least a very basic idea. I mean, this, is, this comes uh, straightforward. So what you can do is, um, the easiest thing would be send on all channels. I mean, we're talking about safety critical systems. So um, if I have more than one option, why not use all of them just to make sure that uh, I'm successful. However, this is not very efficient in terms of channel usage and also resources. And like I said, we don't want to put all cams and dams on the cellular network. What we could do instead is, I mean, assuming we have a position-based uh, addressing and routing scheme, uh, select some kind of long-range te technology, for example, cellular, for destinations that are far away, and use um, the local ad hoc communication um, for the short range. This, on, under the assumption that the packet deli delivery ratio usually decreases with distance in the ad hoc network. So if you um, look at the ad not just for the single hop, but also for the multi-hop link, um, I mean, you add more hops with a certain error probability, and so uh, after a certain distance, it doesn't make sense to basically use the ad hoc network anymore. Um, another strategy could be select um, ad hoc ad hoc network uh, neighbors. Uh, no, sorry, the ad hoc networks if neighbors are available. Use cellular otherwise. This more or less um, deals with the um, situation I mentioned earlier. That basically you have the 11P device and you could inform others, but you know that nobody is there, so no beacon, no cam, nothing um, in a very long time. Then it could be useful to switch to the cellular network to cover a longer range that you could otherwise um, not cover. This is also useful, for example, for overtaking a system where at least I think some measurements showed that um, the distance that you can get with a cam might not be enough uh, if you um, are on a uh, on a high, I'm not on a highway, but what would be the right word for rural road? Yeah, okay, on a rural road, thank you. So, uh, like I said, I don't have any answers, but hopefully soon. So, um, what we're currently doing is we um, implement these multiple technologies, or we integrate these multiple technologies in our simulation framework, um, which already provides all the Etsy protocols, and we did a lot of simulations with ITS 2.5 already. Um, and uh, it also has a fairly good, at least, LTE model that we can use, but we also um, look into, for example, including other ad hoc technologies, because I think it's not just like LTE and ITSG5, but it's also what, what other technologies can we use. Um, and obviously, I already mentioned this uh, in the team on presentation, we intend to try this out on the field, so it's not just like simulation study, but um, whatever works in the simulation will also be brought to the field so that we can uh, try it out um, on the one side in the Timon project, but we also intend to continue with our work regarding the mobile edge computing integration um, on uh, the German A9 highway. So, to summarize, um, heterogeneous ITS today, um, it's statically assignment. And the focus is mainly on information dissemination from the infrastructure or sometimes information collection regarding floating car data. This is also, I think, very um, highly uh, regarded. However, I think um, adaptive heterogeneous networking um, enables to use available resources efficiently. Um, it can improve uh, the quality of service, but I think this is obvious. Uh, what is maybe even more important is that it's extendable with future technologies. So, I mean, uh, even though it's 11p today and it might be in 5 or 10 years, but uh, we don't know what comes afterwards. So, I think the, the concept at least should be um, there to have other technologies as well. Um, what we try to prove in Team One also is that it allows for a straightforward in, in integration of vulnerable road users. So, they most probably don't have an 11p device on the cell phone, even though I know there are prototypes. Um, but we can, for example, in include them via the cellular link. Um, 
And what I think may, be, may even be the most important thing is that it can ease the market introduction for CITS because I mean we heard about the chicken and the egg problem, especially for the more or the less demanding services where we need someone actually to talk to. And, and in the first phase, uh, distances between two equipped cars can be very high. Uh, so why not use the cellular network to provide the initial services already? And um, as soon as the penetration increases, uh, gradually switch over to ITST5 based communication um, to not overload uh, the cellular network. However, and uh, I think this is my takeaway, I had more questions than answers, and uh, there's still a lot, of to, a lot to do in this area, either for 5G or for CITS in general. Thank you. Thank you.